Okay, good morning. It's great to see you all and everybody online. Uh, I want you to grab your Bible. You're going to need your Bible. I know we kind of um, kind of come codependent on the screen, but we're going to jump to a couple of passages. Uh, one in the book of James. We're going to be uh, in Ephesians 6 in a little bit. We're going to uh, look at the last line in the Lord's Prayer is what we're doing. We've got two more weeks where we're talking about prayer. And uh, we, we said, let's launch this, this new year as a year in his presence, a year of prayer. So I was thinking um, this week, I was thinking back when I was in middle school, so junior high Jeff, um, imagine, um, uh, I still have, I think, post-traumatic stress sy- uh, syndrome, is that what it is? Um, I mean, from lots of moments in middle school, actually, when I think about it, but uh, I was in the gym class, again, back in the physical education, and the whole class was to introduce you know, the, everybody in the class to different sports, right, kind of throughout. I don't remember a whole lot of what we did. I was always, I loved basketball, come from North Carolina. That was, that was kind of the sport, played soccer, a little football early on. Then I realized I was too, like, weak. Um, like, I was always short, but, but slow. So, you know, I was really, um, no, actually, I ended up playing soccer a bit, found something I could do. But, but in gym class, we had a couple of weeks where we were, uh, we were wrestling, like legit wrestle. Any wrestlers in here, anybody? For real, okay. Animals. These people are animals. I'm not talking about wrestling. Wrestling is something else. But wrestling, like we had two weeks where we're learning how to wrestle. So the, so the gym teacher, you know, he would coach, would match us up with people about our size. And so I'm like wrestling, I think the same guy, you know, like for like a couple of weeks. And we're learning tactical moves and all this stuff. But we were then, I know in college, high school, it's a little different. Uh, Olympic wrestling is a little bit longer. Maybe we had two minute periods, three two minute periods with like 30 seconds in between or something like that. Because I'm telling you, two minutes of wrestling is all you can handle. Like, it is, it's exhausting. It is mano a mano. It's on the ground wrestling. One person, like you've never been that close to somebody ever in your life. That's awkward. But you're doing that thing. And then if you know how to, you know, do the moves and all the stuff, somebody who's a lot even weaker than you, if they know the tactics, they can take you down. And they can hurt you. Like, I still remember, like, this is not... I no, I'm out. And I'm tapping out like that hurts. I'm out. Sorry. Um, because wrestling can just wear you out. But here's the thing. I want you to think back on your week, maybe some stuff you're going through in your in your head, your mind, your relationships, work. Does life ever feel like a wrestling match for you? Any mass confession. Anybody wrestling this week? I've been wrestling. It's been Life is hard. See, there's one word that Paul uses in Ephesians 6 to describe the Christian life. Struggle. It's a struggle. But the word is, in the Greek, literally wrestling. On the floor, mano a mano, man to man, I mean hand to hand, combat is the Christian life. So some of you know in Ephesians 6... He says, are struggling, or uh, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of heaven, of evil in the heavenly places. We've noted that heaven doesn't mean like off somewhere out there. Heaven means in the spiritual realm is where this is taking place. You're in a fight. You and I are in a constant wrestling match. And I'm here to tell you, I might be reminding you of something today, some of you, that there is a spiritual presence and a force that's at work in our lives. And today I'm going to talk about who we fight, I'm going to talk about what we fight, and I'm going to talk about how we fight. Because you and I are in a battle. And I've been around the world to places like Venezuela where I've seen witch doctors. I've been in West Africa, Nigeria, where I have seen demonic activity at work. I've seen it here in the States. I've been to places in Asia, in the Middle East. I've been across different parts of Africa, India. I have been to places where people know there's a spiritual realm. In fact, it is the very thing, the knowledge of it helps them make sense as to why things are the way they are in the world. Instead, here in the modern West, we're like, well, I think that, that guy needs an education is what he needs. That's terrible. Wow, he, he killed some people. We probably need to bring some more finances towards this you know, rehabilitation or something. 
Instead of, you know, we're, we're looking at people who are just evil. Some of y'all remember, I think it was Silence of the Lambs, creepiest film of all time. Hannibal Lecter, the, the, um, you know, the investigator there uh, is talking with him. She says, what happened to you? And he says, this guy, the, the, the villain, he says, what do you mean what happened to me? I happened to me. You, you will not admit, it's essentially what the character says, that there's actual evil in the world. I am the personification of evil. That's what I am. What do you mean what happened to me? You're going around trying to define it in certain ways. And the Bible's very clear. Listen, friends, I'm here to tell you we're in a fight. We're in a battle is what it is. And so today we come to this latter part of the Lord's Prayer. But before we get there, I want to put it in context like we all have been doing every week. And if you're a guest, we've been going through the Lord's Prayer. I encourage all of us to look back at all the messages because we're unpacking the Lord's Prayer, which is a handbook for holiness. It is a summation of the life of a disciple is what it is. So each line needs to be put in context. This is for kingdom people, by the way. That's important to note. This is not for everyone. This is for people who have set their hearts on the Lord, received his grace, and said, I am following you. That's what I'm doing. Because the, the, the verses uh, in the, or the, the, the prayers within the prayer, the larger prayer, are really proclamations of what we know is true. It's what we're, where we already, we're already walking with Jesus as our guide is what he's saying here. And so let's all say it together. Let's pray it together. We've been memorizing it, saying it. I want you to continue to do that. Maybe it's, through, maybe it's an Easter project for you if you've not done this. We're doing it in ESV. It goes like this. Let's say it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And here it is. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Amen and amen. So this last line we're going to look at is this, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, at first, a first reading of that, it looks like, wait, we're asking God not to tempt us. Like, Lord, please don't tempt us to, to do evil, which seems a little strange, right? In fact, James 1, 13, he says, uh, the Lord doesn't tempt anyone towards evil. Um, now, we'll make a distinction here, because I don't, I don't know if you know that the Lord does test us. He does put us into tests, so we'll, we'll make a nuanced distinction there but remember again this is for kingdom people what is he saying if he's not really saying lord please don't don't tempt us like lead us to evil because you might be doing that that is not not what it says instead it's we're proclaiming what we know to be true early on we say hallowed be your name you are holy he's holy whether i say so or not right so what why does he want us to say because it reminds us who we're talking to he says give us this day our daily bread well, I've already, we said, I, mean, I, got, I got bread. Why am I asking him to give? Because it's a reminder that he's the one who gives us all things. We continue to ask him, give me everything. Bread simply represents everything I need in life comes from you. He is Abba, Father. So the prayer ends with us asking him as we're kind of heading out, if you will, in prayer constantly. Lord, lead us not to sin, but as we follow you, you're the only one. Here it is. You're the one who can lead us from temptation and the evil one. Not me. We cannot rescue ourselves. I cannot keep myself from evil. I have a propensity towards sin. And so here we're, we're looking at, we're following our guide, Jesus, again, okay, presumed. He is the master of my life. And so as I follow a guide, it's like climbing a mountain. If I stay behind the guide, I'm good. If I get off track, I'm in trouble. Lord, you lead me. That's what we're saying, because I cannot lead myself. But we also need to get our minds around this. When we think of temptation, we think, okay, so then we're tempted to sin. Uh, next step, sin. That's what we do. Temptation, sin. No, 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 no. Temptation can lead to obedience. This is what I want you to see. You're going to be tested. We're going to be tempted constantly. Even in this hour, you'll be tempted. This afternoon, this week, tonight, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be put to a test. Opportunity for growth, for obedience. The message puts it this way. Keep us safe from ourselves and from the devil. Because there is an article here. I, I tend towards the translation. I think um, I, there is an article there that, that seems to match the pattern in the book of Matthew. 
do not lead us to temptation and deliver us from the evil one. And it's kind of nuanced because whether it's the evil one or evil, demonic forces at work that are at play in our lives all have a single goal to kill, rob, steal, and destroy. And so this is what we're up against. We're saying maybe the better translation, rescue us from ourselves, as we're going to see today, the flesh, evil desires, and rescue us from the evil one. The word is uh, satanas uh, in, the, in the Greek, or diablos. You've heard that word, but the devil, uh, hasitan in, in Hebrew. He's an accuser, he's a liar, and he is a slanderer. Not all of his works are, tempta- are temptation. Now, the first thing we need to come to grips with here, and I'm going to set this in context. We're going to look at a couple of passages. A lot of teaching today, okay, that I'm going to teach you to watch for, to fight against the evil one. But the thing we need to do is understand his tactics, understand his methods, okay? So the first thing that's so important, what I'm trying to get to here, is, is, is that there is an, there's evil forces. There's a spiritual world in which we live. And again, a lot of us in, in the modern West think, you know, that's, isn't that kind of like pre-modern superstition, all that stuff. And that's precisely where Satan wants us to be. You got no enemy. There's nothing really at play. You just live your life. You can do this. A leading American psychologist, Andrew DeBlanco, he's a professor at Columbia University. He wrote a book called The Death of Satan, subtitled How Americans Have Lost the Sense of Evil. Now, DeBlanco, who is a self-proclaimed secularist, by the way, which means not spiritual, interestingly, He's the one who says this, the great problem in America is that we have lost in the modern West this sense that there's objective evil and objective good. He says, we've jettisoned the idea that cosmic evil, that transcendent evil doesn't exist. And now a way of life, he says, which, in which the ideas of transgression and accountable self, the accountable self, are fast receding. I would say disappearing. That the autonomous self now can proclaim what is true, what's not. I can choose my own truth, and I'll live my own life. And Satan has sifted us like wheat. And this is where the culture is heading and where all of us are heading any given day. If we're not pursuing Christ, we are in a battle. We're in a war. And and if you remember this, I mean, I've been in this all week long, like the past couple of weeks, just aware. It's made me aware. Like, dang, there is stuff coming at me all the time. All of the time. Listen, be clear. The devil is real. He's real. He's not omnipresent. There are demonic forces at work in the world. This is true. We see it in the Bible. Jesus taught it and proclaimed it. He came uh, tempted by the devil. He, he, he came and demons fled. He would talk more about the evil uh, spiritual forces in the world more than anyone. Why? Because he could see them. He knew that this is happening. And every one of these evil forces, they're intelligent at force. The devil is an intelligent force. And he and his cronies are all hell-bent on capturing your soul and taking you down. And it is a constant battle. Paul tells us, again, their authorities, the cosmic evil, their, their evil forces spirit in the spiritual realm. So first and sadly, we need to remember and be reminded that there's a spiritual realm. And we need to live with this kind of awareness. We live, listen... I've said it before. We live in occupied space. You live in occupied space. It's in the spiritual realm. We see an enemy that wants to take us down. But here it is. In Christ, I'm not trying to scare anybody here. In Christ, we have power to overcome. But what we're fighting for as already kingdom people, okay, assuming that this is what it says, who this is for. This is not for everybody. These are for radical people. The fight is for an unrestrained intimacy with Jesus. That's what the fight is. Because as Christ stirs our affections for him, our focus is on him, and we've talked about it, we'll, we'll, we'll land here today. What we need is the expulsive power of a new affection that allows every other affection that comes into our hearts and our minds to, to be just done away with. But it's a constant battle. And it happens all throughout life. And so what I want to do is put this in context. The the evil in the world has a threefold uh, stratagem. Uh, John Mark Comer has recently read a book, I mean, written a book um, called Live No Lies. 
And it, the subtitle of the book is Recognize the Three, Three Enemies That Sabotage Your Peace. It's a good book, by the way. And lots have been written about This is all throughout Scripture, the New Testament in particular. Threefold strategy, and it's this. It's outlined in Scripture. The devil, okay, the flesh, and the world. Now, the distinction's there. The devil, he plants deceptive ideas in our minds. So he, he deals in disinformation. He's a liar. He's an accuser. Okay, deceptive ideas then that are that are played out to in, in uh, to our d- disordered desires. That's the flesh. So the fle- you, you know instead of well the devil made me do it. No, your own sinful flesh, a propensity towards sin. We have a predisposition towards sin, and we need to recognize that. So these disordered desires that become normalized in a sinful society. This is the world. This is the air we breathe. Constant lies are coming at us, and we need to learn to discern what is true and what is not. The premise there, of course, is you've got to know the truth. It's why we've got to be in God's word, you'll hear me say this morning. If you're not in the word, filling your mind up with the truth about who you are, about who God is, and about the world, no wonder you're struggling with sin. Because you're not combating the truth. So these three enemies of the soul, the devil, okay, spiritual forces, the flesh, ourselves constantly, and the world. And the problem is not so much that we tell these lies to ourselves. We believe lies. We live lies. We live them out. And all around us are these deceptive ideas that wreak havoc on our souls, on our emotional health, and our spiritual well-being. And, and, and we've got to be aware. But listen, be aware of this. Satan outclasses us. Demons outclass us with skill, with cunning and experience. He lays out countless traps for us all the time and throughout the day. C.S. Lewis noted, you know, there's two, two really contrasts here. Either you're living like, and some of you are already wrestling in your mind. Even as I'm saying all this, you're like, oh my gosh, this is, like, this is scary. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to sleep tonight. This is a spooky stuff. We, we get over, overly obsessed with it all. And then the other is to believe that he just doesn't exist at all. And that's where he has most of us. So in Christ, I want you to see, only God can protect you from these attacks. Only the Spirit of God can give you power over the evil one. He is an accuser. Watch this. Satan just doesn't just tempt us towards sin. He's also the accuser. So when we fail, when we fall, he then he's quick to pile on ridicule, shame, and blame. This is where many of us live much of the time. And because we seek to follow Jesus, want to live holy lives, when we fall, then sometimes we feel like we need to pay this penance. And Satan says, yeah, you do. You're beat down. You're not worthy. You need to stay there. Stay down. And we need to keep fighting. That's the fight. That's half the fight for some of us. So we need a rescuer. We need a defense attorney is what we need. Who will constantly bring us back to who we are. It's why we were singing this morning. It's why worship is so important. Why you need to be here every week. Well, remind me again of who I am. Remind me again of how much you love me. That's who I am. That's who I am. I'm loved by you. This is what's true about you. You see? It's why the regular experience of worship and being with other believers and hearing the word preached and taught is so critical to our lives. So who do we fight? We fight the devil and evil satanic forces that are at work in our lives. What do we fight? Well, Ephesians 6 says we fight the schemes of the devil. That word schemes is the word uh, methodia in the Greek. You catch that? Method. The methods, the strategies of the evil one. This wrestling that we're in is tactical. You've got to know your, 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 who you're fighting up against, and you've got to know how to fight. This is why Jesus came into the world. I don't know if you know this, but 1 John 3, 8, it says, the reason, listen to this, the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came. When Jesus came, it was an invasion. What John calls in 1 John, light into darkness. And so when Jesus came, he was dropped into enemy, uh, into enemy lines. You've heard of, of halo, high altitude, low opening, where you jump out of a plane at the last minute, you open your chute so you don't die, and then you're in enemy line. Now you get to fight the enemy. 
Jesus was dropped in from all the way, uh, from the very highest place, Philippians 2, from the top all the way down, disrobing his, his, uh, his, his really his, 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 his Godhead, if you will, all the way down to become a man. Yes, God, man, who then steps into this space as an invasion and he comes in to fight against evil. And now his spirit lives in us, those of us who've received Christ. We are victors because of him. But the spirit is now in you to give you power to overcome. So I want you to turn to James chapter 1. Because what I'm going to do is unpack the strategies of the evil one, the schemes of the evil, the methods of the evil one. And this is going to help you. Some of you are going to want to take notes on this. You're going to want to come back to this sermon. You're going to want to look at the sermon response guide that's online. Go deeper this week so that you can overcome sin. I mean, how many of us, how many of us are wrestling with sin? Raise your hand if you're wrestling with sin. Just raise your hand. If you didn't raise your hand, you're done. You're toast. I, I, I told my son growing up all the time, I tell my kids, but with Travis uh, growing up, I say, listen, the good guys fight. The good guys fight. Meaning, it's a battle. It doesn't mean you're a bad guy. You're in the fight, and the good guys fight. And if you don't think you're struggling with sin, I'm struggling with sin all day long. I mean, challenged with temptation all the time. We need to admit it. We need to, we need to say, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. I, I can't do this on my own. That's the first step. And in James, he tells us how we can look at the strategy. Okay? And this is what's interesting here. In, in, we, we see this pattern in Genesis 3. We see the same pattern in uh, Matthew 4, Mark 1, when Jesus is tempted. Satan is cunning, but he's got a pattern. And I want you to see it. Look at verse 12 of chapter 1 in the book of James. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. This is the same word that's translated temptation in the, in the Lord's Prayer. Because, because the same word is translated kind of differently, nuanced, depending on context. Having stood the test, same word, that that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Obedience leads to life. Disobedience leads to death. There's all kinds of ways to die. This word trial is, is the word test, temptations, trials. When tempted, verse 13, no one can say God has tempted me. Here it is. For, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So here, here's what happens. What, what is happening? God does allow tests in our lives, like, like situations, if you will. And I say allow. No, he sends us into test. I don't know if that messes with your mind a little bit, but think about this. In, in, um, in Mark 1, when Jesus is tempted in the, in, the, in the wilderness, in the desert, it says he was driven out by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. The Lord tests Abraham. He tests the people of Israel. Throughout the New Testament, we see this. Uh, puts Peter to the test. You and I are put to the test. God puts us in these spaces and places. Why? Because, well, he, he'll, he'll tell us. We'll see that in a moment. He says, no, actually, you can count it joy. What? Because it leads to obedience and growth, you see. But don't confuse the occasion with the cause. And, and what I mean by this, if you have a teacher who gives you a test, let's say you're in algebra class, you get a test, you didn't study for it, and you, go, and you make an F. And you go, well, if the teacher hadn't given me a test, I wouldn't have failed it. Right? Blame it on the teacher. Blame it on the test. No, no, no. The occasion is the test. The cause of your failure is you. You see, what happens is there's a test that can lead to temptation. So look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. Okay, watch this. The flesh. And enticed. This word is lured. Now he's using some fishing analogy. Like lured. Like a fish goes by. That looks pretty good. Look at that. You know? Oh, look at that, look, look, a frog, a little frog, that's a worm, you know. And, and what happens is you might go, worm, see, for different ones of us, right? Ooh, that's nasty. I'm not going to eat a frog. We all struggle with different sin. Satan knows, the evil one knows, he's cunning, he knows where your weaknesses are. And he comes after your weaknesses. So then what happens is uh, each of us, we, see, a test can be a temptation. I could say it this way. 
The test is, is the context, the space within which the temptation comes. It's a situation you'll find yourself in today, this week. Look at verse 15. Then after desire, this is the word epithumia. I'll get to that in a moment. It means uh, epi, you hear the word epi, um, uber desire, over desire, that con- it has conceived. It gives birth to sin. Watch this. Now he uses kind of biological language, um, really kind of sexual language, because there's this, you're, you're um, seduced, then it's conceived. So something's conceived. There's, there's something that's not born. Birth into sin. It gives way to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, has a grand, there's a grandbaby involved. Death. What happens in sin, once we step into sin, it leads to a form of death, not life. That we're supposed to be living abundant life. So here's how this works. It plays this way. Listen to this. this You've got to know this this week. Testing, okay, will come. It's going to come. Watch for it. In the test comes temptation. Temptation leads to obedience or disobedience, okay? Testing, temptation, obedience. So first, you're placed in a test. Then you're tempted in a situation. Watch for the situation. Happens all day long. This means like all the facts, okay, all the stuff, all the forces. You're in a situation, and now the test comes. God wants you to grow through the test. Why does God test us? Look at what it says in second second, uh, verse there in chapter 1. James, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Some of you are going through trials right now. You're tempted to doubt. You're tempted to wonder if God loves you or not. You're tempted to follow after things to fulfill some stirring of your affections instead of God. And it says in verse 3, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, mature, and complete, lacking nothing. Now watch this. If testing leads us to be mature, if you're a kingdom person... If you seek to glorify God with your life, as we sang earlier, whatever comes our way, you receive the glory of my life. If that's the goal of your life, and if testing gets you there to become mature, to become like Jesus, to glorify him, then what would you say? Bring it on. Bring it on. Why? Because that is the goal of my life. And too many of us are living weak, beaten down lives. Testing leads to to a maturity and, and a completion, a maturity. That's the end game. And I know this is counterintuitive. Bring on the test. Bring on the test. So temptation is not sin. It's an opportunity for sin. we got to learn to discern what's going on before it takes place. See, once it's in the mind, you could argue, well, that's, that's sin. Jesus said lust is sin. Okay, but, but clearly it's not, not like acting on it. Okay, so you've got, there's, here's what happens. You get in a situation. And there's an awareness and a decision. There's an awareness of what's happening, a recognition you got a choice to make. Okay? So back to James 1.14. The test becomes a temptation when you're dragged by your own evil desire. You're lured in, fishing analogy. We start to engage. We dance with the devil now. Now we're in a place where we're going, you know, maybe, maybe, I don't know. So here's the test. Watch this. Happens in the mind. Stirs our affections. Then it's acted upon the will. Mind, heart, and hands, you could say. The mind, I see this thing, I'm thinking this, and then it stirs my affections, and it leads to action. So with an awareness, you have a decision to make. Is it going to be, here it is, truth or lies? Which will you follow after? This is the crux of temptation. And it could be that you haven't even acted on anything yet. The crux of temptation is, will you believe a lie that this thing that you're now is enticing you Are you going to go to it so that it will bring about some kind of fulfillment that Jesus, God, cannot provide for you? There's nothing in the world that's better than him. Watch this. Almost every lie, every sin starts with you questioning whether God loves you or not. Because if you don't love him, if if you question his love for you, you're going to question his commands. That's what happened in the garden, right? Like, come to come Eve, the evil one, Satan, comes. Uh, did God tell you, really? Like, he doesn't want you. Is he keeping you from good things? The response is, no, no, no. He loves me with an undying love. He wants what's best for me. And so all of his commands are good. Every one of his negative commands are good. For protection and provision. Protect us from something that will take us down and provide something better. 
You can play that out with every one of the Ten Commandments. And, and, it, and it happens in our lives every day. So you've got a choice to make, truth or lies. That then leads to obedience or disobedience. So temptation moves from the mind to the heart, fueling our actions, and we're lured in, we're enticed. We, we, the, the heart is engaged. We bite down, act on the will, bam, you're hooked. And we fall into sin. Back to verse 15. James uses, again, kind of a sexual metaphor, biological metaphor. We're seduced, enticed. This is lust, our evil desire. Sin is born. But this word, I mentioned the word desire. It's epithumia. It, it means like over-desire. Again, epi, like epicenter, the focus, the core. It, it's like an over-desire. Here's the point. We sin not because we want things that are bad. Yes, there's that. But because we want things so badly. Augustine was the one who was, by the way, probably the most prominent, the most influential theologian, first thousand years of the church. He was also, you may not know that, he was also a sex addict. And he could not overcome that particular bent and sin that often is the challenge for, for so many men, in particular, and women. This lust. And he said, the only way that I can, oh, here's what he came to, and this has helped me so much. The only way I can overcome sin is to recognize that sin is actually, I talk about this often, disordered desire. It's love out of order. We go after things that might be good. This is why good things can become God things. Whatever you say is going to satisfy me more than God can, it's sin. This is sin out of order. I mean, love out of order is what sin is. We, we, we turn to other things for, for the, for, to be the author of our self-esteem. And it's often good things. Particularly those of us who are, are believers. And maybe we, we're really pretty, pretty good comparatively. It could be a spouse. For it could be a desire for another. Another person in your life. It could be your children. And if you make your children out to be your idols, you will crush them. And many parents do so. If you make dating or finding the right mate or somebody, person going to fulfill fill this void in your life, if you make, that, you make that an idol, it'll crush you. And in the same way, if you make a spouse, marry people, the person's going to fill all your needs. I have sat in my office so many times. Somebody's been married like a year, two years. Like, we're going to, we, you know, I don't think this is going to go. I think I married the wrong person. Tell me more about this. Well, he's not this. He's not all that. She's not fulfilling all my needs. And I'm like, I'm to her, I'm like, you thought he, wait, you thought he was going to fill your needs. This guy, you know him now. He's a bum. You thought he was going to fill your needs. And I say he's a bum. He loves Jesus, but no, compared to knowing God, are you kidding me? To knowing Christ. See, and here's the thing. This is what's so important. You've got to know that Satan knows your weaknesses and he comes after him. Today, the Rams and the Bengals are playing a big game I heard about. And by the way, let me just ask you, um, who do you want to win that game? And why is it the Los Angeles Rams? <laughs> so, yeah, we're, I'm pulling for Matthew Stafford and the crew. But, um, sorry. And they may not win. It's going to be close, I think. But, sorry. Squirrel. Okay, we'll get back to it. Um, so here's what they've done, though. Here, I know this is true. They have been watching film, right? They've been watching liabilities on the defense. Safety have been watching every – they've been watching – the coaches, they've had meetings. And they're watching everything. They're going to exploit whatever weakness they can find. Satan does the same. He's coming at you where things that I wrestle with and struggle with, you don't struggle with. We need to declare a war against sin in our lives. I want you to think about sin in your life. Maybe it's a particular sin that you wrestle with, that you struggle with. We need to be accountable, friends. I have a, I have a couple of friends in my life, one that's been decades-long friend, who's in ministry, my best friend in, in ministry, soulmate in ministry. He, he texted me this week. He said, Jeff, when can I talk to you? I, got, I, need, to, I need to have time of confession. Because we do this with and for each other. We end up on the phone talking for about an hour. He texts me later and says, man, the next day, he's like, that was so good, man. 
I'm feeling a new freedom. I'm feeling a, a, a release. And I, the Lord is, 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 is just bless me through that time that we had together. And he does this for me all the time. And, and we need people in our lives this way. Some of you need to join the church today. If for no other reason, that reason. God is saying to us today, I'm serious about the one, the one another's. You can't do this alone. You need friends and people in your life. So who do we fight? We fight the devil. What do we fight? We fight his schemes. And we'll close with this. How do we fight? Well, I want you to, to look at Ephesians 6. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Ephesians 6. And I'm going to bust through this rather quickly. And then I'm going to pray over us before we go. In verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. This is a comprehensive battle. All right? That you may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all that you can to stand. Some of you need to determine the day against that habitual sin, whatever it is in your mind, in your heart, the thing you wrestle with. You need to stand. You need to draw a line, no tolerance rule anymore. And the way that you come clean is to talk to somebody else about it, confess your sin to one another. That's the most courageous thing some of us will do today. He says, stand, therefore. Having fastened on the belt of truth, you got to know the truth. Having the breastplate of righteousness, a desire for righteousness, for holy living, and as shoes for, for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, you need firm footed stability in your life. And it comes from knowing the truth. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. Faith protects us from the lies. We're already pursuing him. Moments of temptation with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one and take on the helmet of salvation. Protect your mind with the assurance of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. People say, Jeff, I wish God would speak to me. I just don't hear much. from." Open your Bible. Study his word. Be in a connect group. Get in a group. Get in front of people who are teaching and preaching the gospel. Look at verse, uh, verse 18. Praying at all times. There it is. Pray constantly in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance this week. Making supplication for all the saints. Pray for one another. Paul goes on to say, pray for me. And here we have a picture of a warrior. But we need to remember, I'm not the warrior. Jesus is. I'm not the victor. He is. But in Christ, I am victorious. And he's given me power over sin. And it is a battle, friends. When you fall, don't fall into shame. Come back to the Father who, with open arms, keeps saying, come back, come back, come back, come back. Never grow weary of coming to him because he wants you to come to him. Friends, today, as we leave this place, I want this prayer. It ends really as a battle cry of victory. He closes the Lord's Prayer by saying, as we head out now, let's go. With all that we know about who this God is, what he's done for us, remember this this week. You're in a daily wrestling match. And we've got to get our minds around this. The only way to overcome this disordered love is for your heart to be stirred with a greater affection for the greatest love. That Christ would be your first love. And how, how do we stir our affections for him? Stay in his word. Be with other believers who are pointing you to Jesus, living the life. Be accountable with others. Be a member of the church. Like many have done today, be baptized, proclaim as a declaration. we got to get militant about this. I'm following Jesus. I'm going to proclaim it. Not today, Satan. Not today. So let's do this. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to lead us in just a moment of prayer before we go. Not to rush out. But to pray, I want to pray for you. We consider, um, you know, it's Valentine's Day tomorrow. And for some of us, that's, I mean, that's kind of filled with certain emotions. And maybe for some, it's shame or regret. Maybe it's a great day to love your spouse. Uh, if you're sitting there with your spouse, I, I want you to maybe just take hold of a hand. And I want to pray. I want to pray for our single adults right now. I want to pray for those who are really wrestling with what it is to be single and feel alone. I want to remind you today, friend, you have one who loves you, always with you, whether dating or not or married or not. He's the only one that can fulfill our needs. 
He's our first love. You're in a season, maybe a lifetime, where you are able to proclaim to the world that God alone fills all of my needs. And just praise Him. Run to Him. And for those of you who are married here, I want to pray over you. Maybe you're dating. But for, for our married couples, the best thing you can do for your spouse is to find your greatest love in Jesus. Then you're able to love for free. If all the love you need is found in him, then you can love others without any need for love. In return, you can outgrace each other. For parents, show your children what it is to pursue Jesus above all else. So they'll come to know he never leaves them, will never forsake them. And friend, if you're here today and you've never received Christ, you can do so right now. If you've not joined the church, you need to do so today. If you've never been baptized, today's your day. A declaration of war against the evil forces in your life. What will you do? And if you're in Christ, now that you don't need to do a thing to please him or to be saved, what will you do? What will you do? Give him your life. Lord, you are our first love. You're the greatest love of all. Not that we love you, but you first loved us. So we give you our lives. And I pray that we will be warriors this week with your spirit in us, powerful to overcome sin. May we fight the good fight and never give up. And thank you for the grace that keeps coming at us when we turn to you. We love you, Lord. We give you our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.